All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Semantic Kernel Public Community Office Hours. Uh, as always, this is a public forum, so make sure that uh, you are comfortable you know, sharing or whatever you, you say. This is a public setting, so uh, be mindful of that. But as always, we welcome any and all sort of questions, contributions, any feedback. This today is actually going to be even more of a feedback session uh, for version 1.0. We have a lot of the core semantic kernel team members here to, to chat. And uh, yeah, I think we can just go ahead and get started. I Oh, yes. Today is, for those who don't know, M365 is now generally available for M365 Copilot is generally available. So I think what if it's like uh, Thirty dollars per user. <laughs> so if you, if you want to get the latest and greatest uh, Copilot for your N365, definitely uh, sign up. Okay, no more plugs other than I guess this of like if you want to catch up on some of these latest videos. Uh, last week we had some great demos around OpenAI function calling in Python. Uh, we had um, Azure API management as well, uh, and how all that works with uh, SK. So if you missed that last week, uh, definitely uh, just, you can find those on YouTube to to check out. Um, one more thing is that I uh, the the talk that I gave at the AI conference was probably several weeks ago is also now available. So if you want to see uh, the talk on cooking with semantic kernel uh, recipes for building chatbots, agents, and more with LLMs, you can definitely uh, watch that as well. But probably more interesting to you all is right version 1.0. So Matthew just published this post uh, today uh, around what to expect from V1 and what's beyond that. So I don't know if Matthew want to just come off mute to just quickly highlight this. We'll, we'll go. We'll have a more dedicated time to go over the very specific feedback. But if you want to say a few words about the post. So if any of y'all were in the office hours uh, last week, uh, I gave y'all a PDF that was a draft of this of this doc. It hasn't changed all that much, um, but if you haven't read the the document yet, uh, now is another great opportunity to do so. Uh, and as Alex mentioned, hopefully we'll have some time to uh, go over some of the specifics. And I guess the last plug is there is a discussion board for all of these proposed changes. So if you have any thoughts or feelings about them, please go to that discussion board. Please share your, your, your thoughts uh, so that we can make those fine adjustments before we lock in V1. All right, thanks y'all. Great. Uh, also, the latest .NET 1.0 beta is, is out. So again, if you want to play with the latest that v1.0 has offer, uh, definitely check out this, the latest NuGet package. Um, Python and Java are still the same, although the latest actually on Java will probably, is a teaser of it, but uh, from what I hear, right, we might be getting that into the main branch very soon, maybe even this week. So you can maybe stay tuned for next week's office hours to, to hear from the Java team. Uh, one other thing to call out, uh, and this is maybe Mark, you want to come off me to talk about this, but I learned this <laughs> recently that uh, inside of the docs folder of the semantic kernel repo, you can see a bunch of the, the ADRs, the architectural decision records that are out there to just really understand, okay, this is how the team is, you know, coming with coming out with the decisions around what uh, what goes into V1, what goes into just the overall semantic kernel experience. So yeah, Mark, I don't know if you want to say a few words here. Um, sh sure, yeah. So so this is the um, the process that we're using um, to make decisions about kind of like any architectural changes or, or API changes that we're making uh, within the SDK. And we want to do it um, as transparently as possible. So there's um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get to to 1.0, um, you know, um, by by the end of the year, like roughly. Um, as part of that, we're doing a lot of testing, um, you know, a lot of kind of performance related testing, 
Um, we're adding some much needed functionality. So we've, we've got a, a list of high priority new features that we need to add. And, uh, and then we're also trying to stabilize the API, right? So we want to make sure that the API surface that we provide for 1.0 is stable, something that people can rely on and something that we can build on top of, right? So we want to be able to add new functionality without introducing any, any breaking changes. So uh, we want to make sure we keep people's code kind of like, you know, working, um, you know, working well. Now, the unfortunately, there's a bit of kind of short term pain here, right? Because there's things that are in the API surface at the moment that we need to change so that we're more future proof, right? So we want to be able to extend the capabilities and some of the API um, signatures are just too narrow. So um, we're working together with you know, the, the leadership team and semantic kernel. We're, we're also lucky that we've got Stephen Tobe, um, who's giving us a lot of guidance on what it takes to build an API that's future proof um, and will meet kind of like, you know, the, the needs of, um, you know, future AI enhancements. So, um, so what, what we're doing is we're typically when we're changing an API and if we're breaking an API, we're doing it for a good reason. And there's typically going to be new functionality that will get enabled. As a, as a result of that. Uh, and that new functionality will be documented in the ADRs. Um, the ADRs in general follow a, a, um, a structure where we'll kind of like call out the problem we're trying to solve, uh, maybe show some of the existing code. Um, Alex, if you don't mind, if you could maybe open up ADR number um, 17, right? So, um, so we'll have kind of like, this is the problem we're trying to solve. These are the issues. This is the code pattern that we have right now. And, you know, then we'll kind of call out what the issues with that particular code pattern is. Um, like this one deals with kind of like support for different prompt template formats. So right now we can only support one and we want to be able to support multiples. Um, but there's also some performance issues that we have that we've identified around how we when we're rendering prompts so we can make it much more efficient than it is at the moment. So we've called out some of the metrics um, and some of the kind of like the savings that we're going to um, we're going to gain by introducing kind of like the new um, design patterns. And then right down at the end of the ADR will be some examples of this is what we think the code is going to look like. Won't be exactly right because we still need to do um, the implementation and get the implementation signed off, but it'll give you a sense of kind of the, the direction we're going. Um, once we introduce the breaking changes, we, we're trying as much as possible to make the old APIs um, just mark them as obsolete so, so people can stop using them and they can transition to the new APIs. And all of our samples, like, you know, we've got a, a sample project called the Kernel Syntax Samples. We always update those so that they um, reflect the kind of like the new design pattern. OK, so if you want to understand how we how to go from the current implementation to the new design pattern, uh, take a look at the PRs um, and take a look at the changes that we're making in the, the kernel syntax examples, and you'll see the changes that we've had to make to adopt the new pattern. Um, and the, the new patterns um, are, we are kind of like, you know, streamlining things. We're trying to make it really, really easy to do the easy things. And then if you want to do something much more advanced or much more sophisticated, give you the right abstraction so that you can do your own implementation and you can change the behavior of how the, the semantic kernel works, right? So you'll be able to do things like for this prompt template engine um, change, you'll be able to, if you want to introduce your own prompt template format, um, that's something that's going to be much easier to do than it is at the moment. And you'll be able to combine our template formats with your own template format in the same application, which is something that wouldn't be easy to do, or I'm not even sure if it's even possible to do right now. Um, yeah, so I, I think that that's all I wanted to say. Either. Um, I don't know if there's any questions or Alex, is there anything you'd like me to clarify? No, I think that's good. And I'll post the link to the current syntax examples in the chat, as well as the decisions folder as well. People to look at, read through. And yeah, it's a good resource to stay up to date on everything that's happening. OK, uh, I see a hand up from Link Kai. So Link Kai, if you want to come off mute. Thanks, Alex. Oh, quickly. Well, so um, 
So uh, my first question was the the samples. It looks like it was already answered and it will be updated because uh, I was just working with, well, um, two days ago, I was working with the sample and that uses the uh, Azure Cognitive uh, Vector Search and uh, for Python. Looks like they, Azure Cognitive Search for Python library just released a new SDK and then that broke, completely broke the sample code. Um, so, well, for this V1, looks like you don't have a, a Python version yet. So I guess I would just have to uh, wait until that's available. Um, is there any like a uh, estimate like when it will be coming out for the Python version of S, um, the V1? So we're working with our Python community and we have a Python developer joining the team to help with the final push. Um, my expectation is it should be a, a quick follow after our .NET version. Um, so okay. January, February. Now, in terms of notebooks, you, like they shouldn't be broken, period. If you haven't already done so, like creating an issue or sharing your details in the chat, um, that's something that I want to be able to jump on and, and try to get resolved. Thank you for raising that. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I can send you the, the the code description, the problem. Uh, well, basically, the um, Azure Cognitive Search uh, Python library they ish, uh, they just released the new version, and that has uh, incompatibility with the older ones. So the 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 SK Python library is using the previous version. So once once I use the the new version. It's just that because it's not aware of the new version and it doesn't work. So that, that's pretty straightforward. It was just to probably plug it into the new version for the connector. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I can wait. Uh, it's, uh, it's not. So I was just uh, curious, like when, how long should I wait? Because I was working with the customer and do the prototyping. Uh, the, the the second question is well so yeah I did read the uh, the proposal draft and so the with the change of the function like the template instead of two files used to be the skprompt.txt the other one is the config so now it's on uh, it's combined into one and the one section is the configuration the other section is the template which is which use the YAML. Uh, so for me, um, a little bit complicated here is before, it, let's say if I want to change my own template. Um, so if I have an application and I want to change the, the template dynamically when I generate it, I can just write to that SK uh, prompt.txt. It's just a text file. <laughs> but now with, the, with this one, with this uh, YAML combined with the config, um, it's a little bit complicated. I can't, I can't just blindly like dump it into it. Is for, there any thoughts on that? Yeah, for scenarios where you're dynamically creating a prompt, um, I'd probably recommend using like the underlying APIs uh, instead of having to like do file writes and file reads because that, that's probably going to be slower than just saying, hey, I'm going to create a new semantic function and this is uh, the prompt I'm going to use. Now, I do know that if you use the raw APIs to like create a semantic function in line, it's not the prettiest thing in the world. Uh, so that's actually something that Mark has been working on improving as part of the push to improve the, the template engine. Um, so that, that would be my like high level guidance. Um, and the, the yeah. last thing I'll add is even though like all of our current hero examples show the two files together, we are actually building on top of, we're extending the way that LangChain does it. And if you look at how they serialize it, you actually have the option of saying for the template, don't do it in line with the YAML file, but actually reference a file. And so that will be another approach that you could use to still have separate files for the template and all of your configuration. So if you want to keep doing it the way you're doing it today, you can yep. do so. Uh, yeah, that seems a good approach. Well, so the, the, the use case is it's not that uh, the program is running while well, you just, I want to dynamically generate the problem. It's rather 
for some kind of developers who who knows what the uh, that this they're experimenting with different templates they have a utility and then once they are sure oh this is the one we want and then they just say oh we want to save this and then the other existing applications can just use it without without the user having changed anything uh, so it's like the user team versus the template a proper engineering team, they are separate teams and they use different tools. But the once the the, the prompt development team finalize the, the template, then they say, oh, save it. They just dump it over there. So yeah, if you have an external link to that text uh, for the prompt, that would work. But yeah, the only complication I see is once these two are mixed it together then well i guess there's a way around it um just the app just needed to make sure it just serialized the prompt text into the text version okay thanks um and it looks like there's a few questions or comments on the side kind of uh different templating languages so the reason why we are kind of showing inside of our proposals like handlebars as the example new template language that's coming is that's what the rest of Microsoft is starting to align with. So if you're using something like um, uh, Azure AI Studio and you're crafting prompts in their playground, uh, being able to export it as handlebars is one of their their primary ways of uh, sharing prompts. Um, but but as part of our push for V1, what's really actually more important for us is making sure our interfaces are solid so that you can theoretically add any template engine as a template engine to Semantic Kernel. And so I see there's some comments about, hey, could we use Fluid? Uh, so what you should be able to do is look at our examples of uh, how we support handlebars, uh, and the, we'll also so be supporting F strings and you'll be able to take those as examples and replicate them with another library like uh, liquid. Awesome. Good questions. Let's see. I'm looking at the chat. Anything else? OK, if anyone does have stuff, just feel free drop it in uh yes we're gonna be <laughs> if there's nothing about specifically v1.0 or if you're, you just want to simmer on it for a little bit we can talk actually about memory so constantine is a good time but we actually have a few questions to, and discussion points to help seed it so uh this came from uh submission so Chirag is asking about kernel memory is it going to have the same type of uh, abstractions as lang chains retrievers and Davis, you want to comment a bit up on this hey yes uh good question i think uh, this is where the kernel is a uh, different uh, lang chain um plugins allow you to do anything you really want to do so you can build plugins to retrieve data and inject that data into prompts um, so it's just a matter of writing a plugin. Um, so you can write a plugin that reads data from a SQL server, from SQLite, from a text file, from an inbox, from anything really, or from asking to the user. So we don't have a specific interface for retrieving data. We just use plugins. And you can invoke a plugin from a prompt, like the curly braces and the plugin name, dot function name. Um, if you're thinking about RAG, like asking questions, generating answers, this is where we would suggest to use the memory plugin. Um, but if you don't want to use the memory, you, yeah, you can totally build your own and put any logic behind that. So it's very, very basic. Uh, unless there are something special about these retrievers that I don't see in that documentation in Langchain, it is basically about making a function call receiving the output string and that string can be injected automatically into your prompts it's very simple i think you could look at the bing uh, google search plugins that you could re consider them retrievers they um you give a query they will go to bing or google they will do a search and they return back the result and the result can be injected into a prompt
Awesome. Yeah, definitely uh, look more towards plugins as the the way forward, uh, especially for kind of new architectures kind of uh, that you want to or new use memory stores, new uh, connectors that you want to bring in. OK, so that actually this came from Discord. And Constantine, if you're already here, so perfect. But Constantine asked this question uh, around like, can we have this sort of community toolkit for semantic kernel? Um, and that way, you know, it's some place to put all of these implementations for things like memory providers or any type of other integrations. So I don't know, Constantine, if you want to come off me to chat a little bit about your thoughts about this. Yeah. Uh, hello. So actually, I'm member of uh, community toolkit for Maui, and uh, so that's so. And actually, what, what guys in, in Maui doing when actual Microsoft? doing actual Maui community toolkit, doing a lot of stuff related to Maui, but they have different uh, release flows, so they can release often and you know, all accept some random requests, so it's it, it kind of faster. Um, on previous speaking, I asked about uh, random providers for like GPT for all or something like that, and um, what I think, uh, so for example, yeah, I saw implementation for semantic kernel for uh, how it's called Lama Shark, you know, the, that library, it's cool. But the issue is it's maintained by, by someone else from these guys or for chat GPT, uh, GPT for, for example. And uh, it means I can use it really in my work because if, for example, especially in this time when uh, API can change, some new cool feature can arrive, it means we have to ask some random guys who should allocate their time to fix their library, which means we can kind of block. So I think if we have some kind of community toolkit, it means it's the right place where we can put all kind of uh, semantic kernel related stuff. And if we need to update it, we can do this by ourselves. So we need to like, ask anyone else. So I think it can be good. And uh, one more benefit again. So again, I don't know, uh, maybe guys from Microsoft, you have specific track of features. So you, you, you can be able to do some random stuff, but in community toolkit means we can do this random stuff for you and then like integrate it, something like this. So that's I would like to ask uh, because I, I, I have to do a lot of stuff <laughs> and I prefer to, 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 to share it with the uh, community and do not keep it private. Yeah. I uh, think it's a great idea, right, Matthew? Yeah, so yes, we definitely know that there's a need for having a home for community built plugins in particular. Um, I was just looking at the community toolkit for Maui and I saw that there's a special organization. I'm assuming it's managed by Microsoft for community toolkit. Um, I did not know that was a thing. Uh, so Constantine, if since it sounds like you're an organizer for the Maui one, uh, if you have any like internal Microsoft contacts that you I can have, share. I have, I have. Awesome. I, 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 I give you a name. Perfect. Uh, you have to reach this person uh, probably by yourself because he, so he actually this person create all this community toolkit for Windows for any kind of stuff. I, I can reach him, but at least for now, you know. <laughs> yes, I will find. So if you're able to share that name, I'll, I'll connect with them and figure out like what's the steps. Um, what we were doing in the short term, our plan was to at least create a discovery repo with a bunch of links to community projects. So if you do have a personal repo, we'd be able to link to it and say, hey, this is these are all the cool plugins that you can use across the community within Semantic Kernel. Um, we were, were wanting to get that out before Ignite uh, and start populating it. Uh, so if you do have uh, uh, community projects that you're interested in, we're actually on the hunt for uh, what those are so that we can start populating that initial repo. Um, so feel free to, I think from Teams, you can get my email uh, address. You can either reach out to me on Teams um, or email or drop uh, links to your repos in this chat. Uh, we can make sure that's included in that, that initial repo. Um, but very interested in looking into uh, this community toolkit organization and if we can be a part of it. This guy worked at Microsoft, so I think everything should, should be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Should be Thank you. Appreciate it. Michael Hawker. OK, great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll reiterate that. Yeah, this is a very 
important and much asked for pain point. Uh, I pasted in a chat and an example from the community, actually. So this guy, I think Jeff Zhang, created this repo, awesome semantic kernel, <laughs> um, which you know I think he's been by himself just populating with things that he's found uh, to be like interesting and useful uh, inside SK. You know, I, I treat this more as the educational resource as opposed to like a proper home for plugins and, and all that. Um, but yeah, no, I, I hear you, Constantine, and everyone else who has brought up this challenge. So yeah, we'll we'll think of or we'll come up with something that that hopefully works. I think this yeah, what you're seeing on the screen right now, I, I think has come to our attention. This is kind of what we're wanting to replicate, uh, but underneath the Microsoft organization so that uh, there's a little bit more visibility to uh, a lot of these awesome projects. And just so that you are, the reason why we haven't just said, here's a, a repo, everyone just like contribute to this repo, <laughs> all of your awesome plugins. Uh, there is an overhead to everything. Uh, and at Microsoft, if you have a, a repo underneath the Microsoft organization, there's a lot of like compliance uh, tax that you have to take. Um, so that's why I'm particularly interested in learning more about this uh, community uh, toolkit organization and if it has less uh, overhead so that we as a semantic kernel team can actually support it long term. Cool. Uh, Constant, did you have other memory questions or? Yes, I have a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry for that. So today I finally managed to run Mm. Mem memory kernel, no, the know this. So kernel memory, kernel memory, kernel memory. Yeah. yeah. Big question. So and, and and now I have a lot of questions here. So first of all, it's super slow. It's like uh, it take three minutes to save six page document. You know, it, it's so super slow, and uh, also. What actually your plan about this library? Uh, if 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 I, if I have to prevent this chatting to this document without pain, what sh should I use? I, sh I should use plugins, but in, in plugins I saw uh, that this memory for plugins you have plan to move into memory kernel. So is it true, or memory kernel will be part of SK? You know what we should do here, and and who actually uh, develop this? Memory kernel because I have to fix performance, you know, because three minutes is kind of a lot for six page document. Um, so about this speed, you might be using the default uh, pipeline, which generates a summary of every document that mm -hmm. you're uploading. Um, and yeah, I would suggest to turn that off. And um, I can point to the, it's very easy. You, when you import a file, you can pass the list of steps uh, and you can execute the summary step. That should make it much faster. Like if you probably five minutes, five, 59 seconds of those six minutes are spent generating a summary. And mm -hmm. so if you don't need the summary, you can throw it off. And summary. we will probably remove it ourselves because we are looking at the summary as a different kind of artifact that can be used from context rather than for RAG. So for the time being, you have to do it manually. Uh, longer term, we'll probably fix it. I mean, like maybe make it the summary optional rather than mandatory, or well, remove it from the default pipeline. Regarding the plan long term, so the memory, the main deployment way of the memory, so what we recommend is to deploy the memory as a service. So you spin up the web service, you have a memory web service. Now you have an endpoint you can talk to via HTTP, so mm -hmm. you can easily build a plugin talking to that endpoint. So you could have a, your own plugin. Mm -hmm. Rather than using the default memory plugin that is an SK, you can create your own memory plugin. I think we need it's, it's time for us to offer one because we keep telling people to create one. So you can create a memory plugin which makes the this is does the same like I can upload files, can search, can answer questions, talking to the web service. So that is what we plan to do long term. 
uh, mm -hmm. these will have a few benefits. First of all, it is asynchronous, so you can decouple ingestion from retrieval. You can have uh, the ingestion that keep going in the background. Imagine that you want to ingest all your emails or all the messages in your chats. You can have that process that keeps going and you don't you deploy that it keeps running. The other part is being a service. We don't have to write every storage connector in C sharp, Python and Java and TypeScript mm -hmm. and so on. So we will write those connectors in C sharp. And as long as we have a connector for every storage, you just use the web service. You don't care if this if the service is in a language or another. It will also allow us to remove the need, the dependency on .NET standard 2.0, because again, it is a web service. You don't care what the web service is running. And um, so um, longer term, we see this, you deploy the web service, the memory, we have plugins, we will provide those plugins so you don't have to write them. And we will write a plugin for Python, one for C Sharp, and one for Java, one for TypeScript, et cetera. So if writing a plugin is very easy. And then um, the other change that we're going to make, the main repo will probably contain no storage adapter. So you, when you store the main NuGet, it will support only in-memory stuff. Like everything that you ingest or retrieve is just in memory. If you wanna, if you wanna pick SQLite, Azure Cognitive Search, Pinecone, there will be a separate NuGet that you can install. That is because we wanna have a one repo for every storage connector, so that we can tell the community rather than we have to do all the work for you and you are blocked, like we're kind of a bottleneck when it comes to adding a new storage connector. We can tell people, oh, you want to connect MongoDB, you want to connect Elasticsearch, you want to connect uh, mm -hmm. AWS S3, create a new repo, this is the interface to implement, release a new get, and that's it. And we can help, you know, but it can totally be open source. It could be under that toolkit repo, for example, mm -hmm. and we can help creating them. So th this should help having support for many more storage types mm -hmm. and also supporting specific storage features like hybrid search and custom indexes and so on and so on. So I hope that helps a little bit with the vision. Um, mm -hmm. If you have questions, please let me know. Or if you have feedback, if something seems to be missing, like one thing that comes, comes up very often is uh, I want to ask questions about my data, and my data is in SQL tables. Mm -hmm. So we have Chris here, we can we can cover that. So in time, over time, the memory service will also provide something like, I want to plug in my data as it is. I don't want to re-import everything. So mm -hmm. it's still longer term, but eventually we will support more data types. So if you look at SK today, you can import only a string. It's up to you to pro to provide those strings, like loading a document, chunking, and mm -hmm. saving those strings. Longer term, you will be able to provide a URL to import a page or a YouTube video. You can provide a um, MP3 to import an audio file. And, and so we're going to provide also more, um, I wouldn't call them, maybe you can call them loaders, similar to Lama Index. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the ideas here is what if I want to use Llama index for the ingestion and mm -hmm. a kernel memory for the RAG pattern? We are also looking at that so that you can also combine uh, different services. Like I, I see there is a lot of loaders in Llama index. I don't want to wait for that loader to exist in kernel memory. So I'm going to do the ingestion with Llama index and then I'm going, I'll keep going with the C sharp and the web service provided by kernel memory. So in theory, longer term, more flexibility, more options, and we will remove the memory from the, the memory class, mm -hmm. semantic text, semantic text memory class. It should probably be removed from the kernel. Uh, we will be recommending people to move over to the new one. Uh, we will totally help with documents and examples. So here is where Mark can tell us when, and Matthew can help us with the documentation and, and so on. Also, I found so for example, you're talking about summarization. So, and I think it so performance can be improved if we can run this summarization in parallel uh, because you know, 
I, again, I, I can mess with project names. I'm sorry. No worries. Yeah, so it, it looks like this. I create a, uh, when I need a process document, I create a pipeline. And for example, my file split by 12 or, or, or something small chunks. And then each chunk is executed step by step. But actually, we can do this in parallel because when we use whatever uh, OpenAI adapters, we, we can call parallel requests as much as we want. And there is no reason to do this like step by step. We can, you know, at least like, for example, run it in four step. Again, it's not something that sh should be done like step, step by step. If you just could uh, cut some part, yeah. and rise. In the extracting the embeddings? Uh, you... Yes. Yeah. yeah the... uh, so I, I think that. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 So uh, I think if I'm going to create pull request to optimize the, the, that stuff, it's fine uh, for this memory kernel. Yes. In the, in the end of repo, that, yeah. you, that every repo, right all our repos right. are open source. MIT, yeah. we totally accept contributions. So we usually push back when the PR goes against the design principles. Like if it goes in a totally different direction, we usually say, sorry, maybe this is not the right thing. But I think for having a conversation here, or maybe we can have a conversation over a draft PR and uh, before you write up all the code, that, that makes it easy. For about the um, calculating, uh, retrieving, generating multiple embeddings uh, in parallel, that's totally a good feature to add. I don't see it uh, super critical right now uh, because uh, being asynchronous, eventually it is those embeddings are generated. But I also know that some people are being throttled by OpenAI, so maybe that is another problem. Or maybe you don't want to pay all the latency of multiple HTTP requests. So yeah, totally good. Like you could also create a different handler uh, that does. The, so you know there is a embedding generation handler. I think it's called Gen Embeddings. So you can. When you register the gen embedding steps, you could associate that step to a, your custom handler. So you could say, okay, I don't like the default handler. I prefer mine is more, is faster, is optimized, etc. You can also do that. So we wanna, mm. so we don't want to tell people all the features must be in the repo. You can always extend the default implementation as long as you implement a specific interface, which is the case here. There is an I handler uh, interface. If you implement it, you can register your handler with a name. And then when you ingest data, you can say execute this step name during the ingestion pipeline. And if you if you want, we can also talk about that offline. I'm happy to help. Yeah, thanks a lot. Because the same for me, I'm happy to to make it super fast, you know, and make it better than ChatGPT. Okay, and nice. again, uh, I'm super love this idea about community toolkit even more because again, it's super cool when we have uh, in SK as a core basic interface. And then, do you need any kind of database random you prefer? Please do this. Share with this community. And again, if I need, you know, this is also important because. Uh, I have several clients right now, and all of them it's in, in enterprise because only enterprise can afford chance you know? <laughs> And as they said, we not allow you to use library for a random guy from internet. For me, this is so super important too because if, if someone will create, for example, let's imagine uh, positive scale integration, I, I can take this code. It means I have to copy source, now I have to maintain myself, so it's annoying. But, yeah. but at least when it's kind of community, it means uh, anyway, it's kind of by Microsoft and everything is fine, so no one just drops it. So again, Really cool. Thanks a lot for your answer. Cool. Yeah, great discussion. And I think there's a lot of exciting things to, to see. And again, I'm a big fan community toolkit. So hopefully we can create a good home for that. All right, so this was from last week. And I think Eddie, yes, Eddie's still here. So, but Eddie and Chris had a great discussion actually over GitHub around NL to SQL, quote unquote, best practices. You know, this is such an emerging area. I think this is really just like the initial attempt to try to solve this, this big problem. But I don't know if Eddie or Chris, you want to, for the for the community, for, for everyone else, right? Maybe explain the high level of what, you know, what you guys talked about, what, what sort of insights that you gathered and what are maybe some of these best practices to, to share. Yeah, so 
for me, I was just looking at this as um, this is all incredibly new. A lot of us are learning as we're going. And um, I had figured, you know, just based off of the blog post and some of the research that Chris had done, that he would have some knowledge that would be helpful to me with implementing this. And I wanted to just get an idea of some lessons learned or ways that like with better internal understanding of how these mechanisms work, like how to implement this for this solution I'm looking for. And um, I had originally posted this before I had anything essentially working. Um, like whenever I had first submitted the question to you, Alex, and I updated this GitHub discussion after Chris and I had talked a little bit and after I had kind of got a working solution going and implemented. Um, and this is just like trying to understand how to work around the semantic reasoning of programming. Um, like you guys have in the semantic kernel, like those laws, I can't remember exactly what they're called, but the idea of like the models will get better. Don't write code that's going to go like have to get updated if the model gets better. The and so I just laugh. wanted to, I just wanted to distill some of that knowledge here uh, for the community and some of the discussion that Chris and I had going back and forth. Thanks for that, Eddie. Yeah, thank you for your help. I really appreciate it. Yeah, do, Chris or Eddie, do you want to maybe go into some of these like ideas? Uh, I remember seeing stuff like, oh, maybe you could use creating a separate view. Maybe you could make use of planner to define the query. Um, yeah, if if you if anyone here is particularly interested in this, I would encourage you to go read it. It would be difficult for me to summarize here without taking up a lot of the time of the group here and I I want you to have the opportunity to get to some other questions but um I had a few different approaches here the main one that worked for me um was so long story short as to what I'm trying to accomplish here is I have a SQL schema if you haven't heard of NL2 SQL it's some great work um there's been a long history of people attempting to do this just trying to change uh create natural language to SQL commands and um, the bigger part for me was not only was my schema necessary in order to create the natural language queries, the problem that I specifically ran into is that I had columns such as state code, which could be a number that correlates to an actual state name. And so I had to feed that information into my context, which is fine for states because, you know, there's in our case like 52 because you have Puerto Rico and stuff. But when you get to something like a county code, there's so many counties, you're overwhelming the context. So how can you actually get the into the memory? And so we had different discussions about different approaches. Uh, with county, for example, we were just better off doing a lookup table, but for states, that's small enough that you could have a kernel memory inst instance running um, and then plug that in as it's necessary. Ideally, what I wanted to do was have the zero shot of the prompt come back with here are each of the columns that I need and then I could sequentially go through them and get the context if necessary but I was actually just better off at the end of the day just putting in column descriptions and basically a JSON serialized dictionary of what all the different value types could be having it ask the question do a relevancy search on that and then passing in like the top five uh, results and then just having it generate the query and run from there. So that's what I have working right now. I'm tweaking a little bit here and there, but any other big lessons learned or anything, I'll try to post this discussion. And if anybody has questions, reach out here. Awesome. Thank you for that, Eddie. Anything to add, Chris? Oh, no, I think that was a great summary. You know, it's kind of like the query generation meets reg in terms of with the vector memory and um, the uh, and um, uh, you know um, the application I thought was really compelling. Um, do you think there's a point in the future where uh, it, it could be demoed for the community? Yeah, um, I I haven't posted to Alex yet. I did get approval, so Alex, if at some point you want to have a conversation with me about setting up a demo for this, I'd be more than happy to do so. Yeah, yeah. Ping me on this <laughs> Discord. We can set it up. I thought it was really cool. I mean, people see it. It's really going to speak to the domain, I think, just to see see it working. 
Yeah, just a sneak peek. The reason why this works so well for us is that the database is running a base essentially in the browser cache. And so there's no risk of, you know, writing to the database or having bad query execution because everything gets validated server side. So we, we can kind of play around with this as much as we like. And then if the user messes up their database in some way, shape or form, we could always just wipe it, redownload the data and we're fairly good to go. Nice. Low risk, high reward. That's what I like to hear. Cool. Well, that's actually, I mean, these are the questions from, from last week and it's from Eddie, but we guys got some new questions in the chat. So I'll start with Sager. So Sager, if you want to come off mute, feel free to, just so that I want to share more context. But you ask, when function calling OpenAI plugins, how can we customize their descriptions and other parameters like we did for functions so that these plugins can be more suitable for planner? Someone from the SK team want to take this one? Or actually anyone from the community want to give a... Sorry. Came off mute late. Um, I didn't get it all in my brain. Are we looking at it on the screen? I'm trying to find the text. All right, I'll I'll post it on the screen. What's this question? Saver. Function calling OpenAI plugins. How can we custom? <laughs> descriptions and other parameters like we did for functions like adding descriptions because uh, right now we pull those descriptions from the open api schema right mm -hmm. like it's like if you if you own the open ai plugins you should update those descriptions there is there a desire to override those is that the ask i think I think that there is a way that you can provide your, your own URL instead of the one that comes from the plugin. But what I also saw is that you, I think that you don't use the, the file, the, the AI plugin description. Um, because when you have an open AI plug, plugin, you have two descriptions, the open API schema and also an AI plugin with description for model. And I think that you don't use the description for model. And I think that OpenAI uses the opposite. They use the description for model more than the open API uh, description. So for now, what I'm doing is just I copy the description for both the open API and the description for model. But it's like giving the two the same information in two places. Uh, I got it. Um... Yeah, so as part of our march towards V1, one of the big things that's missing in semantic kernel is like an actual an interface at the plugin level. Because right now, as you called out, we import the plugin and everything at the plugin level, like description for model, is just kind of thrown away and not used. Um, I don't think that you even read it. I think it just, yeah, it's just, just like the, it's ignored, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Our you, goal. You read, you re, I think that you read it only to get the URL for the, for the, and that's it. This is what I saw in the code. That is correct. Um, so first step is actually having a interface for this plugin, uh, so it can have the attributes like plugin or description for model. Once we've added that and kind of plumbed it through, we'll start honoring that description and using it in planners. Um, but if you can imagine it, it might be uh, a bit before that's available. Uh, in the meantime, it sounds like what you're doing is the right step. Um, yeah. I guess that's what I'll say. Yeah, good discussion. I think gave us some homework to do to, to look into some more, but appreciate it, Sager. Okay, uh, Chris has a question. I'll place it in the chat. Uh, but it's about GitHub Copilot chat, right? Where there are these certain commands, uh, backslash, that uh, enables some shortcuts. 
So how would you enable this type of functionality in a chat application? I don't know if we have any of our chat copilot team here to comment on this. Um, I mean, this hasn't come up in discussion. Um, just I've heard of it. The uh, wh what kind of shortcuts? So a, a customer was uh, wanting to do shortcuts for like common operations uh, instead of someone having to type out the whole thing. Um, so like basically, like uh, kind of like an alias. So like in in GitHub, uh, you have like create workspace in GitHub chat. So it'll like do the workspace and then execute whatever other stuff you want to do in your um, in your in your in your prompt in GitHub chat. So um, I, it's it's a it's a Microsoft customer, so I can't give the exact examples, but basically shortcuts to execute functionality, right? Or to force the to force the copilot chat to do an operation, maybe. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, this is a great model. Uh, I'll, I'll create an issue for us to um, do some homework and um, ramp up on what they're doing. Um, OK, I, I can contact you as well directly. Same oh, excellent, same thanks. The, I know the team will be interested in this. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Chris. All right, we have a few minutes left. Any last minute questions, feedback, or anything from the community while we have people here? Chris, go oh, ahead. Th yeah, this is Chris. Sorry. Uh, so, in celebration of this GA uh, uh, co, uh, this, you know, the copilots in uh, in Office uh, at three sixty five. Um, any has anyone developed any uh, plugins or a plugin strategy for the copilots, or do we have any examples of that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I think that the copilots, if they're not today extensible, they're the plan is to actually make them extensible. And you could use semantic kernel. You could use these plugins, whether the plugins come from ChatGPT or the plugins are authored by Semantic Kernel. You should be able to bring them in to your um, N365 Copilot experience. And I think the beauty of that if, is that if you're using PowerPoint, if you're using Excel, if you're using Outlook, that experience should hopefully translate or at least like carry over into all your, your product experiences. Uh, is that available today? I, I don't think so. I, not sure it's, it's not available today it's um we're, we're thinking about that around um uh next year may for some type of beta um, program although there's going to be an announcement for you to listen to around ignite that touches on the very specific topic but there there is an extensibility model for copilot using plugins if you do have teams based message extension it's a shorter lift because it's just basically some um, tweaks to your manifest to get that going awesome Thanks, Fabian. Uh, OK, there's a couple maybe quick questions we can do on chat. So Anthony asks, if you had to recommend which SDK is in the lead, what would you recommend? I think it's, it's would be C Sharp for sure, because that's where the bulk of the uh, the team is, is developing in. Um, from there, I think Python is probably ahead. And Java soon after, just because that's the order of of operations or order of the the chronological order that it was released. Um, yeah, and then you ask, is there a reason to invest in one language over the other in the context of agnostic AI orchestration? I think ideally, when you, all these get to 1.0, you know, my my impression is that there could even be some like independent directions that these uh the the language frameworks can can take like if you're a python sk developer you know you could be doing some more python things that leverage a lot of the ecosystem uh and same for java and c sharp so yeah that's it, it's really about like what environment you're comfortable with and the tooling that that's around that so uh, OK, and Jose asks, what's the best way to use a local LLM? Uh, yeah, the, there's a current example around 
kind of just wrapping it, right? You you launch your own endpoint and then you wrap it inside this interface. Is that going to change in 1.0? I mean, as Mark mentioned earlier, right? If it's under the kernel syntax examples, that means that this is this will still work <laughs> with 1.0, and probably is like the the suggested path for that. So hopefully that's the right answer. I don't know if Mark wants to correct me. Um, but yeah, the, the, the same, the experience will still be the same. Yeah, I'll look for the question in the chat and I'll add more information there. Cool. All right, I think this is it in terms of stuff that I see. So yes, everybody, thank you for dropping by and yeah, feel free to come by future office hours. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everybody.